Yes, I'm always this theorem always guides my that 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 tells me that that's all there is to find. Okay. Like the lemmas we developed show that those are solutions. This theorem says not only are they solutions, that's all that there is to find. Because it's this is the general solution. Now, there's a gap in my logic at the moment. I haven't really exposited what this linear independence means. But, I mean, just to tell you briefly, it essentially means that they're not the same function, right? Or they're not, you know, I can't have like one of these be sine x and one of these be twice sine x. Those would be linearly dependent. Or I can't have like e to the x, e to the minus x, and then I also have cosh x. Because I can build cosh from e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by 2. Cosh x is linearly dependent on e to the x and e to the minus x together, right? Yeah, but we don't we don't have we don't yet have the terminal we don't yet have the technology to detect that. Um, but it is in fact the case that the solution sets that we found in lemma five and then lemma six these are linearly independent. Like x and uh, e to the x and x e to the x are linearly independent. They are genuinely different functions. You can't write one as a scalar multiple of another. Um, okay, so. What are we missing? I mean, we can keep doing this, I think, but I hope you guys understand. I hope this is enough for you to get the idea. As long as the polynomial that we're working with just has, what, real roots, then we're okay. Right? But what did we work out the other week? Do you guys remember what we worked out? What did we work out? Remember this? We worked out that y prime prime plus y equals to zero has y equals to sine x and cosine x. I think I just did sine x, but we, we, we derive sine x from that by integrating. Making, we, I think I used the VDVD trick, VDVDV trick, VDVDX trick, and I integrated and I derived arc sine that we solved for y. I got sine a times sine plus a constant or something like that. If I have, I think the solution I found, I found the solution like y is equal to, I think I found this, a sine of x plus a constant. Um, oh, right, I got in some minor argument with Kang about this because he was thinking I was solving the arbitrary problem. I was finding, finding the specific problem with the one here. Um, you remember? So this is, you know, a cosine phi um, sine x plus a sine phi don't tell my calculus two students about this. I'm doing their homework right now. Um, cosine x. So this is C1. This is C2. You see we've got an arbitrary linear combination of sine x and cosine x, apparently, in this case. So wh why, why doesn't this fit into, like, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the deal? What makes this problem different than what we've been doing in my examples up through example 7 here? Imaginary, right. So this, this has what? d squared plus 1, y equal to 0, right? So d squared plus 1, what is this? What kind of polynomial is that? It has, yeah, it has complex roots or complex zeros, we could say. We could also say, depending on what book you looked at, it, maybe it's called a prime polynomial. I, I prefer to call it a, an irreducible polynomial. It is one which cannot be factored over the reals, right? Right? But, you know what we could do? So let's, let's pick on that one. Let's pick on that example here for a second. So we've got d squared plus 1. How could we factor this? Free your mind of its real constraints. This is d squared minus, minus, uh, minus, uh, well, d, d, d squared minus i squared, right? Where i squared is minus 1. So that is d minus i times d plus i, yeah? And so if I asked you to solve d minus i 
times d plus i acting on, let's say, z equals to zero, what would you say the solution is? I mean, solutions include, this tells me I could put z1 equals to like e to the ix, right? And this one suggests I could put z2 e to the minus ix, right? Oh, you thought lambda was real. I never said lambda was real anywhere, did I? I just said lambda was a constant. See, because these lemmas are also true for lambda being complex, which is why we did what we did last class. We worked out that the derivative of e to the lambda x was lambda e to the lambda x for lambda being complex. This calculus still is totally legit, as are the theorems I've written. However, we got to be, I mean, there, there, there's, some, some, uh, there's something to say here. <laughs> but the thing is, Okay, so you're, you're like, okay, great. That's a, that's a solution. That's, I mean, these are solutions in the sense that if I plug them back in here, I get zero, right? It's not hard to see if I, if I, if I look at, you can check, right? What would Z1 prime prime plus Z1 be? What would Z2 prime prime plus Z2 be? You can easily see that these both give you back zero because twice differentiating the exponential gives you an I and then another I or a minus I, then another minus I, which gives you I squared, which is minus one can plug it in, they work. They are solutions. But what kind of solutions are they? These are not the kind of solutions we're looking for. These are complex solutions. Um, to <coughs> y prime prime plus y equals to zero, right? And I think the thing I, I should, I mean, maybe I should clarify this more at the outset, but we are looking, our goal is to Solve, I said solve, but to be more precise, I am looking for real solutions to this differential equation, right? So these are not quite what I want, all right? So how do, we, how do we bridge the gap? I mean, these are complex solutions. They're not what I'm looking for. There's a theorem that we should use. Here's the theorem. Pretty simple. If I have a linear transformation and it's acting on, you know, the real part of Z plus I times the imaginary part of Z, right? It's a linear transformation and the way it works is that that's L of the real part of Z and I can pull the I out, I times the L of the imaginary part of Z, All right? So, if I have L of Z equals to zero, that implies that L of the real part of Z plus I times L of the imaginary part of Z is equal to zero. I'm actually proving the theorem. I'm not really stating it. Sorry. <laughs> I put the cart before the horse here a little bit. Let me erase that theorem and say observe. That would be more accurate. That's what I'm doing. Observe. That is true, thus this is true. So theorem. If L of Z is equal to zero and Z is equal to the real part of Z plus the imaginary part of Z times I, then what? The real part of Z and the imaginary part of Z are both real solutions L of y equals to zero. Every complex solution, right? Because when you feed it to L, it gives you back zero. But on the other hand, L of the real part of z plus the i times the imaginary part of z, it's L of the real part of z plus L times the imaginary part of z, right? How can I have this is equal to zero? What does that give me? This single complex equation right here, guys tells me simultaneously that both the real part is a solution and the imaginary part is a solution. So whenever I find a complex solution to a linear differential equation, I automatically get two real solutions. Provided it's actually an honest to goodness complex solution, right? None of this real parts non-zero, but imaginary parts strictly zero stuff. Okay, that, that, well that doesn't happen. So how about this? This theorem, how does it play out for the e to the ix? What's e to the ix? Remember, cosine x plus i sine x, right? 
So the real part of e to the ix is what? What's the imaginary part of e to the ix? Yeah, cosine. And this is sine. So getting back to my, my, my you know, motivating, motivating example, hopefully motivating, this single e to the ix gives us what? It gives me a cosine x and a sine x from the real and imaginary part, right? How about the e to the minus ix? What's that give us? Real part gives me what? Cosine x. Imaginary part gives me what? Minus the sine of x, right? That's the kind of neat thing. When we factor an irreducible quadratic, it always factors into conjugate factors. It's always like one zero is the complex conjugate of the other. And it will turn out that the real and imaginary parts coming from just one half of it give us all we need. You see, this is cosine and sine. That's going to form the solution set like we already derived last week, right? And if I use e to the minus ix, guess what? I get cosine and minus sine, which are linear. These are the so here's an example of what I mean by linear dependence. This collection of functions and that collection of functions, they're the same, quote unquote. You can form all the same linear combinations with both of those, right? You imagine yourself building a solution set with sine and cosine. Somebody gives you minus sine. Does it get you anything new? No, you already got sine, right? So all we need is cosine and sine to build the solution set. Here. So that's the other part of the, uh, part of the, the machine here. Um, yeah. Yeah, this, this, so this is like the y1, this is like the y2, so then we get y is equal to c1 cosine x plus c2 sine x, yeah. Now, here's the lemma 7, I suppose. What I'm trying to derive for you guys, essentially, is this, is if we have d minus alpha quantity squared plus beta squared, right, if this x on y equals to 0, this has y1 equals to e to the alpha x sine beta x. Oh, sorry, cosine. Cosine beta x and y2 equals to e to the alpha x sine beta x um, as solutions. The, what's the proof? This d minus alpha squared plus beta squared is equal to d minus alpha um, minus i beta times d minus alpha plus i beta, right? And this has z equals to e to the alpha plus i beta x as a solution, right? And when you write that out, what's it have? What's that equal to? This is equal to e to the alpha x, e to the i beta x, otherwise known as e to the alpha x cosine beta x plus i e to the alpha x sine beta x. So then we use this theorem over here. We have a complex solution. The real and imaginary part are separately solutions. Consequently, lemma 7. So anytime we have an irreducible quadratic factor, we pick up exponentials times sines and cosines. You know what happened? If we have an irreducible quadratic factor squared, what would it give us? Like if instead of, what, what, what would the difference be if I had, if I stuck a square up here, what would that do to us? We get a y3 and a y4, which are just this times x and that times x. But we'll talk more about this next time. So thanks guys.
It's important to understand this because we're going to develop this thing called the method of annihilators, which is basically doing this backwards. So you want to take ownership of what we did today, especially the like lemma, you know, five, six, seven. These are important. <laughs>